All right, everybody, welcome to Virtual Bourbon Event. My name is Steve Akeley. This one's called Our Flagship Whiskey, and we have a very exciting event today. This is really, I think it's become our flagship virtual bourbon uh, event. So this is uh, something that we started really at the start of the, the pandemic, and it's been a great way to connect. Our audience has grown. We've got to meet new people. Many on today's uh, call are new to the ABV network, new fans, which is great. We appreciate that. So it's been a really good thing for us. And I just think this is the best thing going because you get the opportunity to hear from distillery personnel talking about what whiskey is, uh, you know, their flagship, which is, you know, very important to their organization. We talk about, you know, how they came up with it. We talk about what it's like now, what's the future hold for it, all those type of things. And then best of all, we get to taste it. So really fun events. And uh, we've enjoyed doing the first one and we've got uh, some good ones lined up coming up as well. We're going to be doing these every other month. Before we get started, and we will be talking to all of our distillers individually, but uh, I, I want to introduce all of them before we get into an individual component of today's uh, episode. So uh, I'm going to start, um, and we'll go in this order, kind of following the placemat. So uh, again, thanks to Justine Mays for all that she does. She, of course, takes all the bottles and, and puts them out and sends out your samples and makes them look really cool in the, the little mini bottles, and then sends you this placemat, which has a lot of great information on it. So first one up is going to be a Mr. Alan Bishop. Alan Bishop's a good friend. He's at Spirits of French Lick Distillery in Indiana. Alan, how are you doing tonight, sir? Doing great, man. Doing great. Absolutely. So we've got a fun one. We're going to be talking about Maddie Gladden, and uh, it's kind of a newer product for you. But uh, I'll tell you what, if you're going to hang your hat on what's your flagship, I, I, boy, I love that product. I, I've been lucky enough to get to sample it already. And right away it jumped to, and I like all of your products, uh, but that one just stood out and I was like, wow, I know what, uh, I know why he's including it on this event tonight. So very good stuff, my friend. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate all right. It. Next up is Lenny Eckstein of Deer Hammer Distilling in Buena Vista, Colorado. Hey, Lenny, how you doing, man? Doing good. Good to see everyone here. And Lenny, what I like about tonight's event too, it's very diversified in terms of what uh, types of whiskeys we're going to be tasting. So when we're talking about uh, Allen's, it's going to be a, a high rye bourbon with yours. Of course, your signature whiskey is a single malt, and that's what you're going to be talking about tonight. Yeah, that's right. You know, Deer Hammer, we started up in 2010, and the intention was to do American single malt, and I can certainly ramble about that at length uh, when, when it's time. But yeah, I'm stoked to get that in the mix with all these other American whiskeys. All right. And of course, next up is a uh, close and personal friend, the guy who has the distillery closest to my house, which works out pretty well. Somebody who I have a great deal of respect for too, and uh, enjoy uh, spending time over at this place. I call it adult daycare because I just like to go over there and hang out and, uh, and drink a little bit of whiskey. So, hey, Adam, how you doing, man? Lovely, Steve. How are you, sir? Doing good. So Adam Stump, of course, uh, he is uh, known to, uh, for those of you that are part of our, our club or maybe our Patreon supporters, our first ever barrel pick was with his place. It's been very popular. We're down to, uh, I think, just uh, 14 bottles left or something like that, Adam. Damn. It's gone quick, man. Cool. Yeah. Seven Thanks. more barrels where that came from, Steve. <laughs> good, good, good. So uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you about that because uh, right. this went, went really well. Uh, next up, uh, from New Riff, I mean, we got to be excited about this. If you're looking at starting a distillery and, and you want to do things right, I think the blueprint is there. So Jay Erzman of New Riff, you guys have done an amazing job. And uh, I, I think if, if anybody hasn't tried that, it's going to be a real treat for them tonight, Jay. Hello, Steve. Thanks for having us on. Yes, uh, we're very pleased to be here and uh, pick up something remote with you after uh, the visits we've had together at New Riff, I guess, over the last year. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, you've been featured in our movie as well. So, uh, you know, our, our, our first movie that we came out with, you were in that. So we really appreciate you being involved in that. And uh, I, I think you get to MVP for the night because you are doing your uh, flagship bourbon and your flagship rye. So you get two samples that, uh, that you sent us. So everybody appreciates that, Jay. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't, I don't think anybody is disappointed in any way about that. So very cool stuff. So that's uh, going to be our, our panel for today. Again, now we're going to start the individual component of it. And we're going to start back at the, the head of the, the one that I started with there, Mr. Alan Bishop. So Alan, tell us a little bit about Maddie Gladden, how you came up with this particular whiskey, you know, mash bill and things like that. Was there a lot, you know, how did, how did you get to where you're at right now? 
Right. So kind of got to start with the story of Maddie herself. And for those who aren't familiar with Spirits of French Lick, um, we uh, we started in 2016, April 2016, and this high ride bourbon mash bill is one of the first mash bills we laid down. Um, we knew that, you know, starting up that we wanted to name products after the spirits of the local area. We always said spirits of French Lick isn't just the spirits in the bottle. It's actually the spirits of the local place. We use that a lot of times. It's not it's not a necessarily a marketing gimmick for us. It's it's really on my behalf. It's kind of an influential thing, right? I want to I want to pay tribute to these people, help rebuild the Indiana distilling heritage. It was lost with prohibition, but also help rebuild the history of Indiana in general. And so, I knew at some point in time we were going to name a product Maddie Glad. I didn't know at that time that it would be this high ride bourbon necessarily, but it fit and it works. So. For those that don't know the history of Maddie Gladden, Maddie was uh, originally from Salem, Indiana. She was um, a housekeeper for Mr. Lee Sinclair. Lee Sinclair, of course, is the gentleman we named our, our first bourbon after, and we have a bottle and bond Lee Sinclair coming out as well, um, which is an alternative mash bill. But Maddie had worked for him as a teenager, and she had had kind of a rough life. Um, she took off to Chattanooga, and years later, all these kind of vicious rumors started swirling around Salem about how she was the madam of a, of a very prominent brothel in Chattanooga, and she may have owned the one in Chattanooga and later one in Nashville as well. Um, she moved back to Salem years later after being married. Uh, she was on her third husband by the time she got back to Salem. Um, her third husband was a little bit of a, a, a shyster, as it were, too, and, and ran a lot of the local taverns and ran the first uh, moving picture show in town, etc. But uh, she comes to town and she starts building this huge Queen Anne style house. It just, you know, it overshadows everything else in town. And of course, all the local ladies start talking about the rumors about her having been, you know, a madam and all this. And uh, one of the rumors that comes up is that she was at one point in time the mistress of Mr. P.T. Barnum. Uh, the, uh, the, the Obviously, the, the circus, circus guy. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Uh, and that the money may have came from him to build this house as sort of a parting gift when she decided to, quote unquote, retire from the business. Um, the ladies begin talking that she's going to open up a new uh, brothel in Salem, Indiana. Salem is a very small conservative town to this day, but it was a railroad town at that point in time, servicing the uh, New Albany Salem Railroad. Later in her time, the Monon, which ran up to Chicago. And uh, I'll be damned if she didn't start a brothel. So... Uh, you know, their, their fears were not unfounded whatsoever, but Maddie was a, an interesting lady. She was, uh, she was very much out there. She didn't really care what anybody thought of her. Um, she put herself on the line. She made herself the center of town. She made herself, uh, you know, the center of attention wherever she was at. She was married five times. Her third husband and fifth husband were actually the same gentleman, uh, Mr. Percy Gladden. Uh, when they got divorced the first time, he tried to break into her house and she shot him in the face. He lived through it and they were married again a year later. Um, but, uh, sort of speaking to her character, this is a story that I don't think I've told yet, but I just, I actually just got this the other day from the gentleman who owns the Glad house. Uh, he remembered when he was a child going to the local barber shop, there was an older gentleman, actually a very old gentleman sitting in the barber chair. And for some reason, the topic of, for lack of any better word, whorehouses in Salem, Indiana came up and he said, you know, he was talking to the barber. He said, one time I went to Maddie's place and the bar, the, the, uh, the barber said, no, you didn't. That was for the rich guys from Chicago. He's like, no, I did. He goes, when I turned 17, he goes, I worked for a whole year to be able to say that I was going to, I could go in there. And uh, the barber looked at him and goes, well, what'd it cost? And he goes, a hundred dollars. Well, was it worth it? Barber simply says, what's a hundred dollars for a little slice of heaven. So apparently it was worth it. <laughs> so if you're going to, uh, to name a bourbon, a big, bold bourbon from the wrong side of the river, you know, Southern Indiana, um, after a woman, it's got to be the right woman. And Maddie was the right woman to name it after. You know, we wanted to introduce something. I've been talking for the past three years, four years now. You know, we the first two bourbons we came out with were weeded bourbons. And, you know, you get all the rye guys and you just got to tell them, hey, we've got stuff coming for you too. Mm -hmm. And now that stuff is here and it's Maddie Glad. So uh, yeah. the mash... What I, what I think is cool about it, Alan, is, is of, you know you, you released two other bourbons, but you held this one back. It, it'd be easy to release it two years ago or whatever, and, and, and you just say you're working up to it, but you held it back to, to make it a four-year-old bottle and bond product. So I think that is really a, a, a neat way to do it. And again, there's different ways to do things, but I think that was pretty neat the, the way you did it. What would become your flagship, you're, you're ha hanging on to, we like. 
you know, we're, we're, I'm going to hold this one back. We're going to do this the right way. We're going to release it at four years. So it's cool. It is. And I would, I would, I would love to say that that was completely 100% on purpose. Now the goal was always to get everything to bottled and bond, but I'm nothing if I'm not honest with people about what I do for a living. Um, when I first made this mash bill and it first came off the still, I was not a fan of it. And I wasn't a fan of it for the first two years. I, every time I went to the barrels, I thought, no, no, no. It was really just a matter of time. That's what it took. And now that now that it's where it's at, uh, by far of all the things we've released, this is the thing that I'm most proud of thus mm -hmm. far. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that worked out in my favor, thankfully, because for the first two years, I didn't know if it was going to or not. So Right. Yeah. You were talking a little bit about the mash bill and how did you come up with that? Was it, uh, you know, playing around with different things? Was it something historic that you read and you're like, I'd kind of like to recreate something? How did you come about it? So this one was more playing around with things um, than anything else. Originally, I had it like right at 51% corn, and I thought, no, I'll bump that up a little bit, but I'll keep the rye up there. So there's obviously a lot of debate in the bourbon community about what constitutes a high rye bourbon. Um, in my opinion, if you're going to call something a high rye bourbon, go to the extreme with it, you know, mm -hmm. and 35 is pretty extreme for a, for a high rye bourbon. So uh, for us, that makes a lot of sense. It introduces people to the idea of, as always, us being a little bit off kilter from a lot of things that other people are doing in the industry. Um, and it really represents itself very well on the mash bill alongside 10% uh, victory malt. So tell us, yeah, tell us a little bit about the victory malt. Obviously, we're familiar with malt, don't necessarily know specifically what uh, victory malt is. So tell us what makes that one unique. So a lot of what we play with at the distillery are brewer's malts. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, distiller's malts, you have to have them unless you're using artificial enzymes. But those, uh, those distiller's malts don't do a whole lot flavor-wise other than convert starch into sugar. They're, they're, in my opinion, the least sexy of the grains in the distillery, if there's a way to say that. Um, brewer's malts tend to have a lot more flavor to them. They're roasted to different degrees. Um, they really bring a lot of uh, characteristics to pot distilled whiskey that I think are very worthwhile. And I think more, I hope more distillers, and I know the distillers on this show, obviously, are playing around with those things as well. I hope that more distillers will explore those distillers malts and really see how that can change a mash bill in a major way. The victory malt, the reason we went with that is because uh, it, it's got a little bit of a, an aromatic, roasty sort of character to it, but more than that, on the flavor profile, it's a little dry. It's a little biscuity. And I thought with that rye spice, plus I knew I'd be able to pull some fruitiness out of that rye, that that victory malt might be a nice little contrast. You might be able to build some flavor bridges between that and the sweetness from the corn as well. Um, and introduce something really interesting on the palate, especially with the way that it's going to be distilled. Um, and I think you guys will notice once you actually taste this, kind of the, the oiliness of, and, the, and the character of the distillate the itself, um, it sort of plays out alongside that, alongside the mouthfeel and the fact that it lingers for as long as what it does. Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, you know, when it's a, a whiskey event and you've got whiskey to drink, everyone wants to drink it. But I've got one last quick question for you, and then we'll have you kind of lead us through the tasting of your product. Uh, and I'll, I'll ask this to everyone that's uh, here today. Uh, you know, we're, we are talking to craft distilleries, and we know that uh, there is an evolution. Your company's growing. You're, you're getting to the point. Is long term, do you always see uh, this product on the shelf presented as it is today, a four year old bottle of bond? Or do you picture, you know, 10 years down the road, Maddie Gladden would be a six or eight year. And again, I, there's no right answer here. I'm just asking you what you think. Right. I suspect that, that the age will continue to grow with this product. Okay. I think okay. it will with probably all of our products. Um, now, obviously there, there may come a point where we go, all right, once it's at eight years, you know, the ninth year doesn't do anything positive for it. So it may get cut off there, but I do suspect that in coming years, you'll see that age increase. And obviously uh, where we have to be careful being a small pot still distillery and having limited production is uh, once I get to five years, I don't want to have to release another four year. You know what I mean? So I got to, I got to really manage my stocks to make sure that we're not going backwards. We're always going forwards. So, gotcha. um, but I think that we're, we're closing in on the ability to do that very quickly uh, with, with how fast our spirits seem to be catching on for a small distillery with literally no market budget. Um, you know, Julie and myself have really put it out there, and I think it's really starting to uh, to gain some traction. We've had a lot of good friends out there, including you guys, really push things through for us, get us into other states, get us single barrels into other states, and keep doing that. And we'll uh, we'll add a second ship, and we'll we'll make sure that we don't run out of what we need. 
Excellent. Well, it is time now to drink. So everybody, if you haven't done so already, grab that uh, Maddie Gladden bottle and give yourself a pour. And Alan, if you don't mind, kind of walk us through this. And of course, our audience, we encourage you guys to utilize the chat function here. Tell us what you're getting on the nose. Tell us what you're getting tasting. Love sharing those kind of tasting notes. It's a, it's a group experience. So please share what you're getting as you go through this and it'll help the group. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah, for sure. So um, it's, it's kind of funny whenever I do these sort of things. And Steve kind of knows this too. I, um, I don't tend to like giving tasting notes because I like to hear what other people it. have to say. Fair. But this is obviously a different, a different circumstance. So um, obviously on the appearance uh, for a four-year-old, especially uh, you should know before you go into this, this was age uh, number two charred oak barrel. It's the only kind of barrel that we use. Uh, we don't use any threes or fours. But for number two, I mean, the color of that is just a nice uh, kind of medium mahogany sort of color. Um, that I'm pretty happy with, or sort of a persimmon wood sort of color. Mm -hmm. um, the appearance in the glass as well, you'll notice that it's obviously very oily. It has a lot of nice, really, uh, really nice legs on it that really cling to the glass very well, uh, which should give you some idea of the mouthfeel that yeah. you're, you're going to get out of this for sure. So the aroma, and this is where it gets fun for me, uh, because we put it in front of a lot of people, and I've, I've heard a lot of tasting notes, and what's awesome is we're starting to to realize that not only if we, if we develop a character for our distillery, but people are picking up on that. So um, one of the first things that you'll almost always notice with any of our distillates is that we approach things a little differently. So um, we tend to say that our motto is respect the grain. The idea behind that's grain has terroir just like grapes. So if we're gonna put any grain at all in a whiskey and we're gonna advertise it, it doesn't matter how old that whiskey is, we still want some of that grain character to be there, but to be well balanced with the wood. So initially on this, I get a lot of like fresh baked bread, which is pretty common with a lot of our products. Yep. I see that on some people are submitting their, their nosing notes here, Alan, that's in there. So that's cool. The other thing that I get on that is a lot of apple. Um, almost in the same sort of vein, anyone who's familiar with, uh, with some of the Cardew distillates that they use for Johnny Walker, um, they sort of have that kind of green, fresh apple uh, sort of aroma as well. Mm-hmm. Um, anise is another thing that I often pull out of this one. Okay. Um, that, that sort of um, almost very, very, very light licorice, but not overwhelming at all. More like uh, um, an anise type cookie or baked good. And then I always pull a little stone fruit and maybe even a little tobacco out of that. Okay. Yeah, I, I, we're seeing a lot of these stone fruit, oats, baked goods, uh, fruity pebbles charred corn on the cob, uh, warm chocolate, apple, like you said, oatmeal with yep. butter, uh, brown sugar on oatmeal with butter. Uh, <coughs> Very apple, nice. Biscuits, spiced rice. So let's try this and see what we think on the taste here, folks. Definitely. That's so good, Alan. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. So, for me, the very first thing that I notice on the palate is, and I, I'm, I'm very texture orient, oriented, so it's very oily on the palate, which is exactly what we wanted. We wanted this to stick around, hang around on the palate, really dance around, remind you five minutes from now that you took a drink of that five minutes ago, right? Yeah. And that's part of the distillation protocol. So um, with this particular bourbon, we, uh, we kind of change the vapor path of the still away from what we do with Lee Sinclair. Um, with Lee Sinclair, we stay on the light side. With this, we, we go to the heavy side, uh, where it's just straight, you know, pot still distillate, which all of our bourbons are, but in a different, uh, much more direct vapor path. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we do is we actually cut a little more tails into the cut. Uh, and the reason we do that is for that mouthfeel and for that lingering sort of effect. So it's very oily. It has a Jolie's favorite catchphrase, creamy mouthfeel, which we're doing a show that includes a bourbon named after a, a whore. So, you know, it is what it is, guys. <laughs> just saying. Um, I always get a little almost eucalyptus, almost herbal sort of thing off of this as well. Yeah. Molasses is there. Sort of a Ceylon cinnamon sort of uh, thing as well. Obviously clove, a little bit of ginger. I can pull some slight citrus out of it, but it's not necessarily uh, orange. It's almost more of a, a grapefruit sort of character. And then of course that rye has that kind of, I hesitate to say spicy because everybody says that. So I'll give a very particular uh, sort of thing that I get from it, which is grains of paradise. So mm -hmm. for those who aren't familiar with grains of paradise, it's everything that black pepper wishes that it was. 
<laughs> okay. And you're right about the finish. This one does linger. It, it's very, very just warms you up and it's kind of stays at the back of your palate. And uh, yeah. Yeah, the thing that I, I love about it is that the, the actual palate and the finish, there's no breaking point between the two of them, in my opinion. They just, it all runs into one experience. There's nothing that, you know, you, you do get obviously a little more of that stone fruit, that kind of cherry, maybe even black cherry on the finish, but it all runs together. And it does so in a cohesive manner um, because there's just enough contrast between those different notes and with that oiliness to hold it together. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I think that this is the first time, and maybe some of the other distillates will be like this too. I think at least the least and Claire bottled and bonds are real close to it. I think this is the first time that I've managed to get all those flavors in a cohesive, uh, unit that sort of in some ways might even be confusing to the palate. So, um, I'm pretty happy with that to be honest. Absolutely. Well, Alan, great stuff. And uh, we are off to a good start. This is uh, really an enjoyable whiskey. And uh, you should definitely should be proud of what you're doing there. I, I like it a lot. And I agree 100%. That's a flagship product. So good job, man. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. Next up, Lenny from Deer Hammer. Hey, Lenny, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. I'm uh, sweating a little on the loft of our rack house. Okay. It's, uh, you know, it was raining. I wish it would keep raining. It's hot again in Colorado, uh, but doing good. Yeah, that's good. That's good, good so to be here. Tell us a little bit about the single malt that uh, that we're going to be tasting here in just a little bit. Yeah, well, uh, I can't really talk about our single malt without giving kind of a rundown of why we started Deer Hammer and and how we came about all of this. So, um, you know, Deer Hammer, uh, myself, my wife Amy, we we founded this distillery in Buena Vista, Colorado back in 2010. And the lead up to that, you know, we get the question all the time, you know, what got you into distilling? Why whiskey? Uh, the lead up was 15 years prior, um, really an obsession with uh, making things, but primarily uh, I, I was very much into beer and brewing. And, you know, Alan alluded to brewing malts utilized in distillation. And at the time, uh, looking at what was happening in American craft beer over the previous 10 or 20 years, um, this country really led the revolution in and in innovation in craft beer. And if you look back at the pioneers of beer in, throughout Germany, uh, at the very least, you know, Germany is known for a very uh, prescribed beer. They have their German purity law that they stuck to for so long, the Rhein Heisk about, uh, which, which would prescribe barley, water, hops, yeast, nothing else. And it was as though in this country, American brewers were like, uh, uh, hold my boring beer. Let me give you something even more interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they were going crazy with ingredients and uh, they weren't making the same styles. And, and as distilling and, and you know i think a lot of us are pretty familiar with the history of american whiskey in this country i looked at it as um well certainly an opportunity um but an opportunity on a lot of fronts there was and still is um a, a, you know a landscape that is very much when you think of american whiskey you don't even say whiskey you say bourbon and i think that's great i mean most of my my cabinet is full of bourbon but, you know, why stop there? And for me, having uh, more of a brewing tradition than a whiskey tradition per se, but, you know, over the years, really falling in love with the flavors and the complexities and really realizing that uh, some of these bourbons or stuff out of Scotland, Scotch, single malts, uh, stuff from all over the world was I'm kind of the grown up version of what I would drink when I'm normally mowing my lawn, you know, just, just massive complexity and just the awesomeness that's where everything is uh that's what i wanted to do and uh I, I i'm going on a lot but ultimately what i really wanted to do was uh you know with deer hammer put our own uh you know dna and fingerprint on american craft whiskey and in particular do something with american and single malt which at the time no one was talking about no one cared about it just didn't make any sense and uh to be totally honest i mean you know, we started Deer Hammer in 2010, sold our first bottle of single malt in 2012, and it probably was like 2014 or maybe later before I wasn't 
sure that I made the biggest mistake ever and, you know, spent all our money on something <laughs> that no one cared about. Uh, so I'm stoked that American Single Malt's starting to come around now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm proud that, you know, we, we got to play our part in that. So uh, that is why American Single Malt is our flagship. And, and the genesis of this American Single Malt really comes from a uh, brewing tradition with regards to looking at every single aspect of the process, starting with the grain and finding the most flavorful grains. Our grain bill, you know, being a single malt, it's 100% malt barley. Uh, it's 80% pale two-row malt barley, which uh, I agree 100% with Alan. That is uh, not the most exciting grain to be working with from the prospect of flavor contribution. 100% pale malt uh, American single malt, it's not up my alley. It doesn't have enough complexity. So we bolster that with another 20% of what's called specialty malt or brewer's malts, and that would be an even split of uh, chocolate malt, which lends, as you could guess, like kind of a chocolatey, licorice, uh, slightly, uh, almost a smoky flavor, although it's not smoked uh, in some ways. Uh, we use something called Special B, which is a dark crystal malt, which lends a lot of raisin character. Mm -hmm. And then we round that out with uh, Crystal 45, which is another more lightly kilned malt. And uh, to me on its own contributes a lot more honey than just the pale malt on its own. Um, you know, from there we mill everything on site. We, uh, we mash and louder, which is the typical tradition in single malt. Uh, we actually do a sour mash, which I enjoy. I, I like to look back at some of the traditions and, and then turn backs on traditions. So we use a, a bourbon yeast in this one. Uh, we do an extended open air ferment. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned we're in the mountains of Colorado at about 8,000 feet. Um, you know, we've got, we're right at, we're in a valley. We've got a uh, tremendous, uh, just a huge amount of, uh, well, a, a tall amount of uh, 14,000 foot plus mountains and lots of sagebrush and pinion pines and all kinds of cool uh, flora around us in our valley. Uh, we're just down the street from the river. So I think that brings a lot in. Uh, and then from there, uh, kind of our, our thing that we don't divert from uh, Everything is double pot still distillation on very squat head pot stills. Uh, this one in particular was distilled on our direct fire still, which we no longer have in play, but we're, we're hoping to bring it back. Uh, the insurance company wasn't too happy about direct fire in our distillery. Um, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. But we're going to do it again and just not tell them. We'll do it. We'll do it uh, in, the, in the backyard or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, like, you know, something that Alan mentioned as well. You know, very early on, we use exclusively uh, heavy toast, number two char, new oak, 53 gallon format. And we go a minimum of two years. And, you know, it came up earlier about, you know, ultimate goals and um, yes. yeah. maturation program. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, we've got six year old stuff and we've got, you know, stuff that was made a year ago. Uh, this particular one that we're going to be tasting is only two and a half years, but uh, this might be one of my favorite barrels we've made. I just like the profile a lot. Whereas, you know, from this point on, pretty much everything is three years. Um, but we still maintain a two-year uh, minimum age on our bottle, just print on the back. Because, you know, if something is baller two years, we want to reserve the right to get it in the mix. So it's typically a mix of two to four year. Okay. okay. In our larger format. So, yeah. Well, let's uh, let's give this one a taste. So, everybody, if you haven't done so already, get that deer hammer out. Give yourself a pour. And, Lenny, if you don't mind, kind of walk us through this tasting. We'll start with the nosing. Yeah, sure thing. Well, uh, you know, I talked about the grain bill a lot. And something to think about, I talk about beer a lot. If this was to make a beer, and it did at one point back in the day before we were a distillery, it would be something like a, a big robust porter or a stout. So there's definitely those roasty notes in there. Um, but this one in particular that we're tasting, I get a ton of, you know, baking qualities. It reminds me of, uh, and I haven't had them in a long time, so I might get the script wrong, but they're sort of like those oatmeal cookies with the white glaze on top. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Super cheap, but freaking delicious. <laughs> yeah. uh, I get that on the nose. Um, Orange yeah. creamsicle from Todd Bourbon. Yeah, that's really yep. his last name, by the way. So uh, oh, he brought his idea. Really? Idea. Damn. Yeah. His last name's Bourbon, but last time he refused to produce an Props. idea. People, people emailed me afterwards saying they didn't believe it. So hopefully he's got it tonight. 
uh, very dark uh, chocolate covered raisin, a bit of ginger snap. Yep, yep, that's a that's big good. one. My kid picks up on ginger snap all the time when he does. This stuff. <laughs> yes. You've seen so Lenny's that. kid six, and he will let him nose things to and, yeah. and just ask him, which is a funny, <laughs> funny way to do things because. But he wants his take on it, and you know he'll just he'll tell you what he thinks. So yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's definitely given me like ginger cookies, uh, trees, which is depending on what he's tasting or nosing, not tasting. Um, yeah, not tasting. He's six. Sometimes he'll say truck tires, which is annoying, but he's not totally that off like i could see some kind of rubbery notes and it is astringent um yeah red wine i get that too um but i get i also get i'm kind of mixing at this point tasting notes and uh nosing but uh i get a lot of kind of fall flavors like pumpkin bread um you know obviously a big cinnamon note i think a lot of that comes from the toasted barrel it's a heavy toast do uh yeah so do yeah um a hundred percent malt barley on that question yeah all barley nothing else in this one we do uh mess around massively with other whiskeys we do you know uh a weeded bourbon that's a four grain we do a rye uh we do a hundred percent corn whiskey but this one uh nothing but barley nothing but barley rich vanilla werther's which is always good uh fennel celery yeah, seed yeah all right let's give this one a taste and see what everybody comes up with on that here we go and uh, worth mentioning, it might, I guess it's probably on the sheet, but this one is 53.7% uh, ABV. And that is our cask strength uncut. We, we go into the barrel uh, typically at no more than 105 proof. And we gain a little bit over the years, but um, you, know, you, get, you get some things that going in at a lower entry proof. Um, a lot of times less wood extraction, but at the same time you do pick up a tannin backbone, which you know I'm not mad at. I I think that's part of uh, the deer hammer DNA. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of a cast strength scotch, chocolate coffee mouthfeel. I, I'm getting definitely chocolate on the taste too. So. Yeah, yeah, pumpkin bread. Yep. Yeah, we're big on chocolate around here, and uh, you know I, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but there is such a known presence of scotch and single malt that comes from scotland and you know there's single malts coming out of everywhere there's awesome stuff obviously out of japan and india and you know ireland and wherever else but uh I, i'm incredibly eager for the american single malt tradition to catch more traction and you know as well you know i mentioned that how bourbon has such a lock on what is known as American whiskey, but why stop there? You know, we can, we can experiment with bourbon and, you know, I, I'm looking forward to tasting more on this sheet of what is exactly that, but let's do more, you know, let's, let's let rye become, you know, more than it even is American whiskey and for sure malted barley. Let's let that take its place. So, uh, you know, we're doing our thing. We, uh, we like to mess around this, our single malt accounts for at least half of our annual production. So it's definitely our main thing, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh yeah, Th this flagship. Yeah. So some other things, uh, cocoa puffs, I think is a great descriptor. That's definitely, uh, right along the lines with what I I'm love getting. cocoa puffs. Yeah. Coffee <laughs> and vanilla butter. Um, mochaccino so just like a yeah yeah we get uh, starbucks yeah. yeah yeah big coffee flavors and really big all coffee. of our stuff you know be it our single malt our rye that just launched that's got a huge layer of coffee going on so yeah i think these tasty notes are spot on in my book yeah yeah i was trying to find a way to get back to chat and i can't figure it out on my phone so i apologize <laughs> but that you're fine now. like mayan chocolate man it's yeah it's yeah yeah there's more spice there than I would have figured from that, but it is, it's, it's good. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Excellent man. job. Lenny. Good stuff, man. Thank you. Any, anything else? Anybody getting? Uh, honestly, on, honestly, Lenny, I, I don't know if, if I, you didn't say anything about this and I picked it up and start drinking it, I will have thought it was a single malt. I can yeah. associate this profile because scotch is what I knew before I got into bourbon. And this is Reminds you of, uh, home. a very, very young, uh, a very young scotch, like mm -hmm. not aged yet, but very young cack strength. Yeah. Yeah. That was just started because that's why I ask you if you use barley because right. barley being the, ba the base of, of scotch, 
that's all I'm getting here. And I'm like, if you didn't tell me, I would have bought this bottle and said, I'm buying scotch. Yeah, and you bring up a really neat point. Um, a while back, our first barrel of this stuff to hit four years, hit four years because it didn't taste right. And it just, while we were selling all two-year stuff at the time, this one barrel kept going and going. And at some point, I couldn't fit. It was driving me nuts. Its flavor profile was so much grassier and, you know, even more so to what you're saying. Uh, to me, I was like, this tastes like something out of Scotland. This is not our profile. So I harvested that, well, I emptied that barrel out and shined a flashlight in there and came to realize that our cooperage uh, inadvertently spaced on charring that barrel. Um, so I, I, what that told me was, you know, it was toasted, which was pretty cool. But the difference between uh, a charred new oak barrel and what's historically used in Scotland, which is you know, obviously a ton of ex-bourbon, ex-sherry, sometimes ex-port, whatever. Um, that's a big flavor impact as well, the climate. So I love the concept of like flirting with a style that's you know, has been laid to claim by the folks over in Scotland, even though it's being made elsewhere. And then just, you know, doing what I tend to think is the American thing, you know, pushing the bounds, mixing up, flipping it on its head and saying like, this is American for this reason. So, you know, we're trying to take that and bend it and do our thing with it. So yeah, thanks for the input. That's, it's cool to yeah. hear what people think. Well, Lenny, great job. I'll tell you what, uh, you know, I feel like, you know, a lot of us that are really into bourbon say we don't like scotch and, and we're, we're uh, avoid single malts. This opens up your eyes to how good a single malt can be. So really, really an enjoyable pour tonight. So thanks for bringing this one to us, my friend. Yeah. Thanks everyone for trying. Cheers. Absolutely. All right. Next up is Adam Stumpf of Stumpy Spirits in Columbia, Illinois. Hey, Adam, how you doing, man? Good, Steve. Only, uh, only problem is my uh, little care package that came in the mail is missing the sample of Stumpy. So I don't know what I'm going to do here. <laughs> We, we don't send you your own stuff. Oh, we figure uh, you've got that. Uh, yeah, I, I know you're. Let's 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 test you here. This is this came out of barrel one eighty five. What do you what do you remember about barrel one eighty five? Anything? Oh, I got anything? it. I've, I've even got my notes on barrel. Oh, okay. Oh, got it all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, this one is definitely out of uh, one eighty five, like you said. And at this point, and points earlier, and probably for the next one and a half to two years. Any barrels that you taste out of the distillery are at some point of intersection between when we were changing out distillation equipment, uh, when we're trying out different mash bills, or uh, when we're trying out uh, different aging profiles. So uh, 185 landed in a pretty cool spot. This is the last kind of round of 30 gallon barrels that we did. Um, this is off of our pot still. So unlike that Bananas Foster barrel that came off the uh, continuous coffee, mm -hmm. uh, this is off the pot still, a uh, 500 gallon copper pot. We ran this one through the four plate column. Um, I had the deflamator set at a pretty interesting set point and um, made a, a, a non-typical cut for us on this one. So uh, hopping right into the mash bill on this one, um, we were playing around. So up to this point, we had traditionally run uh, largely weeded bourbon, 60, 30, 10 corn, wheat, barley malt. Um, this one, uh, we ran four grains, so we were tinkering around here. Uh, this one came out 56% corn, 28% soft red winter wheat, 13% uh, rye. This was a cool round of the rye. So, Steve, the, the rest of the rye that didn't make this lot of bourbon made that rye whiskey that oh, uh, was a stubborn German pick. Yeah, so it was our first year ever growing that variety of rye. Um, and we haven't stopped growing it since. We love it so much. And this was also our first year actually growing two-row barley. And Alan, you'll appreciate this one. Um, our friends out at Sugar Creek malted this for us. So this is the uh, first time that we used Sugar Creek malt. And uh, like that variety of rye, we definitely have not turned back uh, since. So uh, this is our first year growing two-row versus six-row barley. Um, we had Caleb malt it. Uh, we had him kiln it a little bit darker. Uh, so we had him kiln it to a Pilsner malt. And um, it, just to try to get a little more of that uh, baking spice quality um, into the whiskey instead of just using it for pure conversion. So um, anyway, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty well it on um, the mash bill. I, only, I, had other, I have other stupid notes like the field of or the field of barley was right across from mom and dad's house, soybeans a year before. And okay. 
all that stuff. So we could get as nerdy as we want, but uh, that's yeah. that's kind of the uh, the important stuff off of it for sure. It kind of goes into uh, you know congratulations on the label redesign too. I love the fact that kind of I don't know what do you want to say kind of um, silhouetted in the in the background or you got your notes. Uh, out oh of yeah. Them. Who came up with that idea to put? put your notes on the, on the label. Was that you or your brother-in-law or? Uh, yeah. So uh, that was uh, kind of both of us. Uh, and that came whenever we were, you know, we're like, well, we're trying all this crazy stuff out. So uh, let's just take a couple pics of that and incorporate that into, uh, into the label. So there's all kinds of crazy charts in there and yeah. stupid notes. That's if you ever go to Stumpy Spirits and, and uh, so. yeah, ha have Adam take out some of his notes and show you. Cause I, I don't know. I just love that part of it. I, and, and I love the fact it's old school. It's handwritten. It just reminds me of the, you know, the way they used to do things. Now today we think about taking notes. Everything's in the computer. You will let me pull up the database and I'll pull the notes on. Not with you. You've got, you've got a, you know, notepads where you've written things down and just it's, it's a combination of charts and, and uh, you know, things that are, you've narrated down there. Uh, it's just, it's cool man so i was, I was yeah. glad to see it on the label it's, it's awesome man yeah absolutely so this uh this one we ran the uh, the deflamator uh actually at the same point that we ran that rye whiskey interesting thing about the cuts on this uh whiskey though it's probably going to be pretty evident when we taste it um i was i was really really digging the fruity notes that were coming off of the still early and so much so that i i remember running this and like I wanted to make a super, super early cut, which would have been, you know, a lot of quote unquote heads um, and ages for a really long period of time, but I only had a bunch of 30 gallon barrels. So I made an earlier cut from heads into hearts than I normally would have. Um, and then oddly enough, I made a, an earlier cut from hearts into tails than I normally would have as well. Um, and I think that fruit really comes out. And I, I think the wheat is contributing a lot of that because it was evident right as it was coming off the still so okay uh, pretty interesting there the, the last question before we it's the same one for everyone you know what's the future of your flagship whiskey going to be like is where you think it, it'll evolve over time and if so kind of give us a little preview yeah absolutely so uh like i said for probably the next year and a half at least it's you know what you get um out of any of our whiskeys is an intersection of um, barreling, we started in 15 gallon barrels, moved to 30 gallon barrels, went to 53 gallon barrels. Uh, when we fired back up on the continuous, we hit some 30s right away, and then it's been exclusively 53s for the last two years, basically. Um, and then uh, we've got all the different distillation equipment. We've run um, four distilling systems and are designing another one for whatever reason. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, a lot of that fun uh kind of experimentation like what this product was which is under our you know our normal flagship um 90 proof bourbon right now which is 32.99 on the shelf at schnooks um you know that's going to change so basically everything right now is minimum usually about 30 months old um so two and a half years give or take uh once we hit that stuff off the column still, we're looking at about three years minimum. And then eventually we're going to push to four is the plan, launch a bottle and bond at four. Um, and then try to take the portfolio to eight is the, uh, the name of the game. Long-term down the road. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the long-term down the road. Um, and what we've also done is we've kind of consolidated um, our mash bills. So while we were tinkering around with all these different mash bills early on, um, we have got one particular mash bill that we're, running um for our you know flagship bourbon and flagship rye and flagship wheat from here on out um so kind of standardizing that and then we're going to move uh, of course we're not going to quit doing any of the, the crazy stuff like the bananas foster mash bill and all that stuff um uh that'll all just run under that distiller select label which is uh you know its own kind of unique skew and and our way to kind of uh let people tap into the crazy experience that we have in the rick house cool well and, and Lenny handled the question for us already, so we don't have to ask that. So thanks, Lenny. That was good. Uh, let's let's go ahead and uh, give this thing a, a try. So pour out your, your stumpy spirits, your old Monroe into your glass. And Adam, if you don't mind, as people go through some nosing of this, tell us a little bit about your whiskey here, what they should yeah, be. You've all got better olfactory senses and palates than I do, because I cannot pick up all the crazy <laughs> notes that, that you guys do. Generally, like whenever we're sampling through barrels that we're going to dump, um, we'll pick maybe 10 
And if you look at my notes, they're just like pluses and minuses and dashes. Uh, you know, I'll scribble down some tasting notes, um, but we, we generally don't get too terribly in depth until we zero in on the barrel. Uh, this one is super, it reminds me a lot of when it came off the still, honestly, it's crazy. It's That's got a like lot of that fruit, fruit character right there yeah. in it. Uh, I almost like, I've never had this before, so I can't really say it for sure. But I feel like if you caramelized like a citrus peel, uh, I'm getting a lot of that kind of kind of <laughs> burnt sugar and citrus. Actually, Steve, this is really unique. That barrel that you tasted when you were at the distillery the other day, you said it was a tangerine bomb? Yeah. That was the same mash bill as this one. Really? Okay. Yep. Yes, yes. That was uh, barrel 174, right? I'm on the lookout for those. Yep, it was a it was a few barrels earlier than this one. Um, if you see one seventy four, that's a tangerine bomb. Get that thing uh, and tell me about it because I want to I want to come in and buy the rest. You can have one and then I'll buy the rest. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, you definitely get that wheat. The wheat is definitely most prevalent for me, quite honestly. And I mean, at twenty eight percent, you would expect that. Um, we did uh, this particular barrel was a thirty gallon barrel. I think I mentioned that um, we did a medium plus toast and a number three char on it. Uh, entry proof was on the higher side. We don't enter really this high at all anymore, um, but we entered that into the barrel at 119 proof. Okay. Uh, here, and a couple other uh, notes here on the nose, Jolly Rancher plus cinnamon. I'm, I'm kind of getting myself uh, kind of applesauce. So that yeah. kind of plays in with the cinnamon in there. Fruitcake, lemon bars, um, almond kringle. A couple people have said that. So that's good. Wheat heat, honey wheat bread. That's cool. Yeah. Wheat checks. Yeah, so. the wheat is, wheat's definitely there for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it, it's kind of goofy. Uh, we, we should have had a lot more rye in our portfolio at this point in time. Uh, actually, when we were originally designing our bourbons, um, we had intended it to be, you know, kind of a, a standard rye bourbon instead of a weeded bourbon. Um, but we screwed up and bought rye grass seed instead of cereal rye seed <laughs> the first year. So our portfolio kind of got delayed on rye. So this is when we were still playing around with it. Um, and like you guys know, though, uh, wheat generally takes quite a bit longer to age. Um, I would have liked to have seen this one probably hit the four year mark, um, but definitely thought it had the character and stood up well enough at, uh, at just two and a half years. So. Okay. Well, let's give this one a taste now and see what we think. And uh, again, share those tasting notes for us. Fruit stripe oh. bubblegum. Yes. I can see that. I, I can see that on the nose. Yeah. Yeah. Caramel apple from Danny. Yeah. Yes. That, that caramel apple one reminds me uh, of a kid. Yeah, when uh, kind of a caramel, green apple specifically reminds me of Cherry Mike and Ike's. Yeah, yeah. Tim, it's funny you mentioned Cherry Mike and Ike's. I get that a lot out of our wheat, a lot. Um, almost, almost every recipe we run that's very prevalent on wheat kind of has that, that cherry note to it. Cacao on the back end, dark cherries. So you're getting a lot of cherries there. Spicy apple. Uh, oak, butterscotch, vanilla, fruit, and marshmallow. These all sound good, man. A little star fruit from Alan Bishop. Oh, man. Doesn't disappoint ever, Adam. No, it's a, it, it, it's a good easy drinker. And I mean, we, uh, we put this thing on the shelf, uh, like Schnooks has it generally, $32.99, $33.99. So um, you're always going to see our flagship bourbon right around there. Um, our intention when we started this distillery was to put as much value in that bottle as possible and uh, present that to the consumer at a fair price. So, uh, you know, we grow absolutely every kernel of grain uh, that we put inside these. So um, whenever you guys taste anything that is coming out of that, uh, that flagship Old Monroe, it's uh, kind of a, a taste of our little, uh, our little region. Mm-hmm. Then you do some experiments and things like that, things like the, what would have fit into that barrel, your distiller select program, where you get to play around and do some different things. So 
Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. We do all kinds of crazy stuff where we did the, you know, I'll use the bananas foster barrels, use that as an example. When we fired up that column, that was my one mash bill. We kind of had four mash bills that we were going to fire up and knew we were going to run, or three rather, that we knew we were going to run. And we threw a fourth in there just as uh, an oddball. And it was mm -hmm. a high rye white corn bourbon. And uh, that banana note was evident just right out of the mash ton. I mean, it was as day one you walked in here and you could smell that fermentation it was uh it was pretty wild so uh, yeah we'll always always have crazy stuff like that yeah cool well it's fun all right well last but not least jay from new riff jay how are you tonight i am unmuted now all right excellent steve thanks for having us again absolutely so we've got two products first do you have a preference the bourbon or the rye first you, you tell me which one you'd like to talk about first yeah good good question what well, i would usually begin with bourbon i think that's what that's uh, sounds like a good good plan to me so tell yeah. us a little bit about your bourbon how you guys came up with your mash bill how you came up with that specific you know uh, bourbon that that you put together and uh, i know you released it as a four-year bottle bond so tell us a little bit about what went into that decision making as well right so um New Rift Bourbon, you know, when we uh, opened the distillery in uh, uh, 2014, we did not walk into that planning to make bottled and bond, let alone to make uh, essentially all of our whiskeys bottled and bond. Uh, we kicked around over the years, you know, should we do a bonded and maybe we, we would have one on the side or maybe we, we would not. We knew we would be good high proof whiskey and we knew that we, it would be uh, bottled without chill filtration. That was a a uh, founding quality principle at New Rift, but the, the bottled and bond notion came somewhat later and it did blossom into a truly a flagship. Um, we gravitated to, to bottled and bond because uh, historically speaking and looking around the whole world of, of, of whiskey, uh, see, we, as, uh, we, we came out of being liquor retailers, uh, the founder of New Rift, Ken Lewis, and myself, we, we ran the party source in a very large liquor store in Kentucky. And so we had the opportunity to work with, with all of the world's great distilleries and everything. And when we considered Bottled and Bond and, and our own goals, which was to be, you know, hard on our sleeve, a quality minded, quality first, if you will, and everybody says that, uh, distillery. And we, we realized at some point, Bonded, how can we not make everything Bottled and Bond? because we recognize bottled and bond as not just a category of whiskey or a market segment or a category for old men and hipster bartenders and things like that. We, we saw it as the world's highest quality standard for yeah. brown spirits in the world. It's higher than the standards in Scotland, higher than the quality standards in a, in a great spirit like cognac, you know, where they can add, they're, they're allowed to add sugar and oak flavoring and stuff like that. And you can't do any of this to, to bottled and bond. It's also um, might be the oldest uh, quality standard at, at a minimum of four years. And it's certainly the strongest. It's the only one that, that insists on higher proof. And we pivoted to bottled and bond only really in the in conceiving of, of New Riff, probably in, oh, I don't know, later 2016 or early 2017, mm -hmm. uh, by which time the whiskey was already, you know, aging very well and resting in the warehouse. We knew it would go at least to four years old. And so Bottled and Bond uh, came upon us later, really in our development a little bit. We just made the whiskey and let it rest in the barrels for at least four years. Uh, if it was gonna take five years, we'd have gone to five happily. Uh, we, were, we were happy with it at, at four years. And uh, so Bottled and Bond is really all that we do, with the exception of New Riff uh, single barrels, which cannot be Bottled and Bond because they are barrel proof. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and everything else about them is bottle and bond they're 100 proof and are uh, uh, four years old but um the uh, the bottle and bond uh bourbon and rye are yes indeed the flagships okay um, we to the point of, of grain bills um uh, alan was mentioning earlier about what what constitutes a high rye bourbon is a great question um for me oh. high rye bourbon comes from uh the, the seagram's lineage Mostly, there, there are some exceptions. I think Old Granddad is a, is a pretty high rye content historically. But in the modern lexicon, it was when Four Roses burst back onto the scene in the mid-2000s, uh, about 2004 and 2005. And suddenly we, we were tasting high rye. It's 35%. They also make a 35% high rye whiskey. Their other grain bill is 20%. So if that's a high rye distillery, my personal definition was 
anything more than 20%, 20% or higher probably deserves to be called high rye. It's certainly quite a lot higher than historically what was used in Kentucky. Uh, our uh, rye uh, content in the bourbon, and we put the grain bill on the back of every bottle. Um, I think my, my background is messing with this. There it is. <laughs> is um, 30% rye. And uh, uh, we, we wanted to form uh, an identity as a rye-centric distillery. We loved it, obviously rye, and we knew we would make a lot of rye whiskey as well. But there's also a little bit of a historical aspect to Cincinnati, which for what it's worth 120, 135 years ago, was the, the, the nation's biggest mart market for whiskey in the, in the country. More whiskey left Cincinnati than any place. A lot of it wasn't very good whiskey. That said, um, this was a, a little bit more of a rye town than, than maybe the greater portion of Kentucky, um, both as a, as a grain commodity city and also uh, as a whiskey. And so uh, there was a little bit of a local nod to being a rye centric distillery. So we wanted to make high rye bourbon and uh, we were trained in the arts, uh, which we'll get to in a few minutes, of the 95% uh, rye uh, recipe by uh, the fellow out of Indiana, Larry Eversold there at Seagram's Indiana. One of the all-time greats, yeah, yeah. One of the all-time great distilled, the best in the business, he's so good. Yeah. He was our consultant at New Riff. And while we knew a lot about whiskey, I guess when we opened, if you put us all together, uh, the distiller, uh, head distiller, Brian Sprantz and myself, and all of us put together had made this much whiskey uh, <laughs> in our right. lives. We had not distilled a drop when we opened New Riff. I wish I could tell you, yeah, I used to run a still in my dorm room. I never did that. Um, and so uh, Larry taught us a lot about how to run the place and certainly taught us the, the black art of a 95% rye recipe. We'll get to that soon. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so we, we are, are rye driven. In fact, when you combine the fact that we make out of our barrels every year, probably 40, maybe 38% of them are rye whiskey. Combine that with the fact that the bourbon has only, that both of these whiskeys have only 5% malted barley. Um, then we have actually distilled about 60% uh, of our annual grain consumption is rye and about uh, maybe 58% and about 38% of our annual grain consumption is corn. We have actually, although we make more bourbon than rye, we have used quite a lot more rye grain in our lives than we have corn. Huh. That's some and good trivia, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a neat trivia, uh, right. it, it's uh, surprising. And contrast that to the old time master distillers down in Kentucky, most of whom hated to make rye. They made as little rye as they possibly could because it gummed up the stills and it was, it was uh, oily and, and, and uh, uh, filmy and it, it clogs everything up. It's just a beast to work with and they hated making that stuff. And uh, so here we are making, you know, using more rye than, uh, than, than corn in our whiskey production. Mm -hmm. Jay, and last question again, before we get uh, started, uh, you know, sampling these, and it'll be the same for both. Is this, you know, will there be an evolution or will, will the flagship, will there always just be, uh, you know, a four-year-old bottled in bond is your flagship? And then I know you might have other iterations that are older, or are, are these going to uh, advance up too as, as the company gets a little bit older? Right. Great question, as, as you've asked everyone. Um, uh, I would love to see them get up to five uh, mm -hmm. and we, we might get there. It's tough to do. Um, right. You have to hold back, you know, what you could sell now at four next year's production. Um, I don't know when we'll get to, to that level. Uh, and we're happy with it at four. Uh, that said, um, uh, it, it could get a little bit older, but not a lot. I don't think the, the plan is to, is to progress this to be an eight year old. We are holding back about 30% annually of our output. Uh, across almost all of our expressions uh, to become quote unquote older. I'm, I'm not sure how much older, six, seven, eight, let's call it an eight year old. Uh, and maybe there's a 12 year old someday and things like that. So we will have some amounts of that, but I think there will always be a core product that is uh, the younger uh, bottled and bond expression on both of these whiskeys and indeed on others. We, um, I mentioned how much, uh, uh, rye we use. Uh, we also make, and this has not been released yet, uh, but it's a 100% malted rye uh, whiskey. And I think that'll come out next fall, perhaps knocking on wood. Okay. 100% um, uh, malted rye. Uh, and uh, uh, that will be uh, also bottled in bond. We have released an heirloom rye whiskey. Our farmer in Indiana, 
uh, grows an heirloom rye, and uh, it's called Balboa rye. And oh, he yeah. was ca casually mentioned to me one day back in September 2014, I think, Yo, do you, by the way, did you know that I grow rye too? <laughs> I about fell out of my chair. <laughs> I'm so excited. He grows rye as well. He's a great corn farmer. And so we've been making his Balboa rye. That is bottled in bond. The malted rye is bottled in bond. Uh, everything we make, uh, I, I, I suppose until we do something like a blend of bourbon and rye, maybe we do such a thing someday. That could not be bottled in bond. But mm -hmm. uh, it, it's all we do here at New Riff is bottled in bond whiskey uh, under the, the world's highest quality standard. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely equate your product with, with quality for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, please, everybody, again, we're going to do the bourbon first. So that's if you're doing off your placemat, it's the last one on the placemat. Uh, so grab your bourbon. And uh, Jay, if you don't mind, just like our other uh, folks from the distilleries have done, just kind of walk through what uh, they should expect as they're nosing this. And then we'll get on to tasting it in just a second here. Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, all of our whiskeys are bottled without chill filtration. It was a, a uh, foundational moment at New Rift to, to, to tell the engineers, you do not have to install, you know, chillers to chill our whiskey down. We're, we're not ever going to do that. And so we don't have such a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so how I like to drink it, and, and I've been saying, by the way, for 20 some years, drink your whiskey any way you want, just buy it from me. <laughs> you don't have to drink it this way. But how I like to drink it is with a splash of water because mm -hmm. being that it is unfiltered, more flavor opens up and comes out with a, with a splash of water. Um, it's, it's nice to drink straight up. You're welcome to do that. But adding just a, a, a splash of water will crack out some additional flavor. So I begin by nosing it. Okay. Of course. Um, a lot of people find a lot of sweetness. Um, however, tasting almost every lot, tasting every lot of a new riff, there are as many times as not that it is, it is drier. There's, there's some dryness. Uh, we have at new riff a, a relatively small, what we call the gauge tank. Some other places would call it a cistern tank. And that is where when we distill a batch of whiskey, a fermenter of whiskey, the spirit goes into this tank and we cut it to barreling strength, which is 110 proof and then it goes in the barrel. And then we distill the next batch, and that goes in the barrel. We distill another batch, and that goes in the tank, and that goes in the barrel. The point is, each fermenter is distilled more or less discreetly from all the others. There's a little bit of, of interchange from the beer well, the, the tank that gathers all of the beer before it gets distilled. But largely, each uh, expression is, is the product of one fermentation. And that means, down the road, we have preserved the flavor of each fermentation from all the others. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of those fermenters are very sweet, very spicy. Some are very dry. Some of them maybe needs to age a little bit longer. It's a little too green still. Um, sometimes some are, are uh, uh, very, uh, very uh, smoky. There's, a, there's some, some, sometimes a bit of a smoky cast of the stuff. So uh, it can be sweet, absolutely. We try and, and at the back end, when we, when we bottle uh, uh, the bottled and bond product, we don't dump in two fermentations or three lots of whiskey. We dump in about eight or nine or 10 and try and pull a lot of, if you will, the genetic material of New Riff into, into the bottling. So there's plentiful spices here. Uh, sometimes licorice root. I don't mean licorice like, like absinthe or mm -hmm. licorice gum or licorice jelly beans, that, but the actual root itself. There are some rooty sort of spices. There's okay. also all the classic panoply of spices that we talk about with rye whiskey, clove. Um, Alan mentioned earlier, grain of paradise, which I pick out of my stuff uh, all the time. Sometimes I get a, a pink peppercorn. Sometimes there's a minty aspect, sort of like a winter green. And sometimes there's a, um, a sort of grassy element. Uh, and that is a rye derived thing. Sometimes I think the rye expresses itself like the grass that it really is in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes up sometimes. Just some other ones on there. Yeah, it's smoke and spice, uh, toasted caramel corn, vanilla, uh, brocks, butterscotch candies, apricots a couple times, yeah. peaches and cream. Um, Alan chance? mentions Angelica. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I can agree with that here. Yeah. All right, let's, let's give this a taste. Let's join Jay and give us a taste. Here we go. all your products, especially the barrel-proof rye. 
floral. We'll talk yeah. about the, the flavor and mouthfeel here in a moment, but to address uh, Mr. Bourbon's question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, barrel proof. <laughs> That's right. Our um, well, our single barrel bourbon. All of our single barrel products, which are a single barrel bourbon and a single barrel rye, those are barrel proof. Um, and in fact, the single barrel bourbon is actually more widely available and more easily found in the market than uh, the single barrel rye, uh, of which we just don't have a ton of it right now. Uh, but the single barrel bourbons are barrel proof. So, you know, I, I appreciate the mouthfeel that we have. Uh, achieved, I guess, in this whiskey. It begins with the water that we have, I think. Uh, we use a, uh, a private water supply at New Riff. It is not city water. It's not municipal water. The first thing we went looking for at New Riff was a better water supply than the city of Newport. And we found it right under our very feet. Uh, we were sitting on top of uh, an alluvial aquifer, which is fed partly by the river, but also more significantly, and mostly, it is supplied by uh, the hills to the south of the distillery. So we are right up on the Ohio River, literally 75 yards from the Ohio River, right across the river from Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. If you drive south from, from our distillery, you go up a hill. And those hills are actually full of limestone deposits. The northernmost uh, sort of reaches of, of Kentucky's limestone deposits, and those filter uh, uh, groundwater down the hill into our water supply. And what we get is a, it, it, this is a silly way to put it, but it's a very watery water. It's like standing outside and the rain is coming down on your tongue. It, it tastes very strongly of water. Um, it, it's the kind of water that, that you don't typically find in, in a tap or something. It has four times the dissolved minerality of the typical tap water in the Ohio Valley. And so our water, when you taste our water, the water tastes big. It tastes like I say, it's watery water. It's very broad and fulsome kind of water. That goes in the whiskey. That becomes the whiskey. Uh, we use it also for the cooling processes in the distillery. We do not at this time barrel with that water. Uh, we use a reverse osmosis water to get a very neutral uh, water going into the, the barrel and also certainly into the bottle. But it becomes the water. And, and if this whiskey has a big mouthfeel, mouth coating, you know, large whiskey, I hope, uh, it began uh, not just with the grains or 30% rye or something like that, but it began with that water. Bread pudding, uh, vanilla ice cream, vanilla bean ice cream. So yeah, some great flavors here. What else? Somebody says, uh, McNew gave the thumbs up. <laughs> Jay, you can use that in your marketing now. Stephanie McNew gave you the thumbs up, so. That's, that's Len, Lenny Eckstein, thank you so much, man. We would love to come to Colorado. Uh, it's a, a cool state, Colorado, with relatively liberal liquor laws. As we distillers know, those are the kind of questions you take into account when, when you're getting out there. And uh, we will get there. I spent a lot of time in Colorado. Uh, I went to school at uh, the University of Wyoming. I got an uncle in Fort Collins and uh, spent a lot of time in Denver and Breckenridge and places like that. So I would love to get out to uh, Colorado. And, yeah, uh, that'd be awesome. I, I know uh, folks out here from sharing bottles of your stuff that I've brought back are oh, definitely stoked on it. So thank you so yeah, much. See it. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to the rye and same thing. Open up your, your rye. Last one of the evening. Give yourself a nice pour of that. And Jay, if you don't mind, let's walk through that one, starting with uh, some, some nosing stuff first. You bet. So our rye is as I said, taught to us by the high priest of modern rye. Um, distillers uh, have a, a, a sort of a, a, a praising and, and, and uh, bemoaning relationship sometimes to the tradition out of Lawrenceburg, Indiana, because uh, that, that distillery, today what we call MGP, and the former Seagram's Distillery, uh, when, uh, when it, it so happened that it went out of business at Seagram's in 2003, and this rye was suddenly on the market, and it exploded into what we, it, it powered a lot of the, the revolution of modern rye, which is fantastic, and it's great rye, and it's, it's one of the all-time greatest rye recipes, actually, to come out of, of Indiana, uh, that 95% rye, 5% malted barley recipe that Larry Ebersole made. Uh, any bar you go into in America, almost today, has got 
that recipe sitting on the back bar. And it's a modern classic. Well, Larry taught it to us. However, we did, as it says on the back label, a new riff on an old tradition. We took the guidance from Larry, and I don't know if you can see this here, and I don't know how close I can get on the crazy, there we go, maybe like that, 95% rye. This is 5% malted rye. Um, we, we put 5% malted rye in the whiskey and uh, really like what it does to it. And uh, uh, it, it adds, malted rye is a, is a beautiful grain. Anytime you malt a grain, in a sense, you have improved the, the quality of that grain, the, the flavor potential. Um, you have changed it at a least. And uh, malted rye is an elegant, sophisticated, just beautiful grain. And to put 5% of it in this definitely pushes it in a little bit of that direction. So we get uh, certainly plenty of, of the typical spicy notes. Um, some people find uh, out of the 95% rye tradition, a lot of dill pickle. I don't get a lot of that in our whiskey. It's not a common flavor, I think, at New Riff. Our spices and our flavors tend to hew more to the hard spices, the clove, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, nutmegs, perhaps, um, pink peppercorn. Uh, there's, there, there's sometimes a minty, as I said before, a minty tangent. Mm -hmm. This one to me has got a little of that mint. Again, hit it with a little bit of water and you will see more flavor come out of the glass, um, more flavor. Uh, develop as this unfiltered whiskey unfolds. Hyssop mint. I'm not familiar mm, with that. I love it. Hyssop, yeah. Hyssop mint. Hyssop, okay. Cream to mint, thin mint for sure, lots of apple. All right, let's give this a try, see what we got here. Black cherry, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, gentle on the f on the finish. Boy, this is... <laughs> slight lavender, Girl Scout cookies. Mm, lavender, yeah, yeah. I like that. Which now, which Girl Scout cookies? Because there's a yeah. whole bunch. True, all, all, each with their own distinctive flavor. So. Right, you got to be more th the thin mints. Okay, he's thin mints. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Jay, it's a it, you know it's so good. It, it's hard to believe that's ninety five five. I, I mean, you would think that it would just be a, a total spice take over your mouth, but it's not. It's it's just very flavorful. It is. It, it certainly gets some some of the, the spice on your tongue and, and, and in your palate, but uh, definitely not overwhelming. It's it's fantastic, my friend. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, these whiskeys excel, dare I say, in cocktails too. Um, you put an unfiltered whiskey, an unchill filtered whiskey, in a cocktail, old fashions and Manhattans and 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 Brooklyns and things like that, and that that texture, the mouthfeel helps round out the whiskey. Or the cocktail experience, but but furthermore, the spices and flavors carry all the way through that that cocktail, all the way into the finish. Uh, they really sort of carry everything along with it. Um, I have uh, uh, quite enjoyed uh, learning more about cocktails, uh, and I've been making them since I was <clears throat> teen years old. <laughs> but um, <laughs> how, how to exploit an unfiltered whiskey in, in cocktail, an unchill filtered whiskey in that mm. world as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great stuff. And uh, Jay, uh, unbelievable. And thank you for bringing two. And, uh, you know, it, it really helped uh, make for a great evening for sure, because we got to try so many different styles of whiskey tonight. So very we sure cool. did. Yeah. Malt yeah. and rye and everything. Yeah. So what we'd like to do now, and again, I always tell our, our uh, distillery personnel, I, I, we can keep them here all night because there's so many questions I'm sure we have. I always tell them an hour and a half. So we've got about 13 minutes left. If anybody has any questions, it can be about their flagship whiskeys. It can be about their distilleries, the bourbon industry, anything you guys would like to ask. Again, you can open up your mics now and uh, feel free to ask a question. You can also continue to use the chat if you prefer, and I will ask it. But again, we'll wrap this thing up uh, right at uh, nine o'clock. Um, Eastern, eight o'clock central. So, 
A uh, quick question for you, Rick. Okay. You so bet. For, for you, Jay. So, so you guys, I personally believe your, um, I don't know, your barrel proof has much more flavor than the bottle and bond. That, that's just my personal opinion. But uh, when you guys release barrel proof, what, what is the idea behind? Because I have about, what, nine bottles of New Riff right now, all from different store, bear, you know, picks. And it ranged from 113 all the way to 103 proof. What, what makes that difference, right? Because your bottle and bond obviously is 100 and, you know, is straight to the point. But knowing how particular you guys about are about your distilling and your method, what makes that difference in the in the proof age of the of the barrels? Great question, great question, and I'm I'm so pleased that you have noticed that and 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 brought it up. In fact, uh, we, I've I've been wondering when would be uh, the first time that I that I uh, address some of this. So uh, in 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 recent weeks, so. Here's, here's the deal. What you see in, in, in New Riff is the evolution in, in terms of, of, of our warehousing and, our, uh, and, the, and the proofs as, as they have fallen out over time, as they've come out of the barrel over time. Um, for the first four, let's see, from uh, 2014 through almost all of 2017, uh, our barrels rested in a, uh, a, a single story uh, building. A warehouse, if you will, but they, but they they were uh, they were in in a single they were barrels stacked on top of barrels. What what in Scotland they call a stow. If you've seen a, a Scottish traditional whiskey warehouse, they have barrels stacked on top of barrels like this, and that's called a stow. And that's how we stored barrels. So there was a single story uh, warehouse situation. We could not immediately afford to build, having already hemorrhaged millions of dollars into building the distillery and acquiring warehouse space and things like that, could not afford to build something like a, a, an 18,000 warehouse building that we couldn't fill up for years. So we had to store the barrels where we could. They went in the barrel, the whiskey, at 110 proof. And so over four years, they, they in, in a single story, they only went up a little bit in proof. Typical proof on, on New Riff for all those years was 112 to 113. Sometimes there would be one that was 110 and a half, and sometimes there might be one that was 114 and a half, but it never went really high and it never went really low. Uh, it was a very consistent uh, uh, proof that was coming out of those barrels. Fast forward a few years, and we have um, had some different aging situations over time as we grew larger. Uh, for, for one thing, we, we, we filled up our initial warehouses and we had to begin storing them in a rick house. And uh, the rick house, um, uh, we have a rick house now. It was completed in December 2017. It's five stories high. Um, that will be a, quite a different aging environment than uh, what we saw in the first three or four years. And that's a product of being a, a small, young distillery. I, I wish we could, we could have said, well, gosh, right there in northern Kentucky, there was a uh, uh, historic whiskey warehouse just waiting to be bought at, a, at, at pennies on the dollar, but that was not the case. So now we are seeing as these barrels that four years ago we laid down in a rick house are turning a little bit, are turning four years old. They're, they're uh, turning out to have lower proofs than the, the, the earlier barrels. And so now the typical proof is not 112 to 114. It's more like uh, 104 or 105 to maybe 108, with some barrels that go down as far to like 103 proof. 103. Anything uh, from the latest barrel pick was about 103. That's but right. I, I have 113 from an older pick, and 110 was the regular thing for the last six months that I found. And I can say I'm an addict when it comes to new riff barrel pick. <laughs> There you go. There I, you mean, go. I, I mean, I, I love mean, it. Pick, you know, barrel picks from all over the place. But I was very, I was shocked that the same store that actually had a barrel pick two years prior, now at 110 and 113, is now handing me the same store 
pick 403. And I'm like, okay, I'm meeting with them Monday. I need to ask this. What happened? Yeah. It, it has to do with, with a different aging environment. And that aging environment will, will change again when we begin in uh, when? Uh, it'll be late 2021 or early 2022 when we start to see some barrels that come out of our rick house that are five stories high. Um, uh, that will push it in a different direction. In a perfect world, I, I really admire the Four Roses method of aging in, in warehouses, where they have a huge piece of land with all this square acreage devoted to single story warehouses, where in each warehouse it only goes six barrels high, because that largely eliminates the, uh, the, the variability of different aging environments and especially of different uh, uh, elevations, if you will, in a, in a rick house. You don't have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine floors, sometimes warehouses are in Kentucky. Um, you, you just have, have one. And so they eliminate that as a variable. That is my favorite way to age whiskey. The fact of the matter is, having put our capital where it really needed to be, which is in building a great distillery, building, dare I say, we hope a great distillery, putting in an all copper distillation path, uh, buying the best grains we have, all the things we do, drilling a well, it would have been much cheaper to, to hook up to the city water, yep. things like that. Doing those kind of things, uh, we could not invest in, in umpteen acreages of, of uh, 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 warehouses uh, to, to do a single story warehousing forever and ever. And in fact, here we are in urban distillery. We're, we're in greater Cincinnati. There are, are you know, stadiums within a good golf shot of our a, a three iron you know of our of our distillery we we are we are not out in the country and uh, and so we we needed to square how do we store in an urban location with uh, the capital we have available and and the future where is that where is it going and so we have found that that some of the proofs have dropped what has not dropped in our opinion at least is is the quality all these barrels still taste delicious they still taste like new riff whiskey um they don't, uh, they don't taste in, in, in any way like, well, it, it's now 105 proof, 103 and a half or whatever proof. Uh, they don't taste uh, out of spec, if you will. They still taste of the character of New Riff. What was your opinion? Do you like that, that lower proof barrel? I, I'm, still, I'm still yet to open it because I just got it Saturday. So I, uh, I, I, had it, I have it right there on the shelf. And I was reluctant to open it because I thought I was, you know, I was cheat, cheating out of 10 proof. So, <laughs> but, but yeah, I will open it and uh, I, will, I will give you my, my honest opinion. Uh, it's, I, I, I just have my, I still have my 100 and, 110 proof open and I serve it to all my guests. And every time anybody tastes it, they go, oh my God high proof new riff is the best so thank you thank you so much hey jay well, two, two two things i just wanted to comment on real quick um first of all thank you for obviously mentioning indiana the secret room thing the whole background because it's easy to hate on that nowadays obviously but right. they kept the light on for all of us hoosiers right yeah the other thing is time. i i appreciate you uh you also mentioning something that that i'm that i've tried to drive as a, a conversation starter in the in the industry the character of your distillery you don't hear much about the character of your distillery so I, I appreciate hearing that when you're talking about you know your products and and even if the proof changes the character is there so thank you yes uh, it, it's part and parcel of being an up-and-coming distillery in the world you know we we now have uh, an 18,000 barrel rickhouse we're building another one uh, we will probably build more in the future but when you are starting off um, uh, it, it's it would have been counterproductive to look, we, we could have made half as much whiskey if we had stored it in a, in a warehouse that, that took years to fill up uh, to put it that way. So uh, we are, are still pleased that the, 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 the style is still there. The, the new riff um, uh, character, as you say, Alan, thank you, uh, is, is, uh, is consistent across that, that lower proof. Um, uh, at the same time, I'm also pleased that we don't have 138 proof new riff. You know, we go in the barrel at 110. That's a pretty low proof to begin with. And I know some of our other, other distillers here embrace a, a low barreling proof. And, and I think that's 
uh, a, a very smart thing to do for a young distiller. Our own uh, research when we were beginning, when we were <laughs> young, if you will, distillers, was that we would um, pick up some different flavors at the lower barreling proof that we would miss at the higher barreling proof. Not necessarily better flavors, but different. But moreover, that we, we learned that through our research that the whiskey would probably show better younger at the lower barreling proof. And so we needed to do everything we could to make a, a banging four-year-old whiskey. We couldn't have a, a four-year-old whiskey that was supposed to be mixed with, co with, with a cola drink, you know, and, and chugged at fraternity parties and things like that. We needed a great four-year-old whiskey. And so uh, if it could be better at, at the younger age, we were happy to, to do that. Uh, but the upshot after the, the four years of aging and longer is that we don't have this obstreperously strong uh, 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 high proof whiskey. We don't have things that are, are almost difficult to drink straight up. I, I enjoy that people say I, I like drinking the New Riff barrel proof single barrels without any water added. Now, again, my plan is to add a splash of water, but if you don't want to, that's okay. <laughs> But it's nice to drink one that's not, you know, too strong to drink at 142 and a half proof or some proof that's too strong to take on an airplane or something like that. Uh, that happens often in Kentucky bourbons at, at barrel proof. And I, I appreciate that, that we don't really do that. So. A couple other questions you, Alan. from the audience. Uh, availability in California for you, Jay. Uh, are you guys out there yet or are there plans to be out in California if you are not? California, um, big state, you know, we, we'd love to go to lots of places. We keep hearing on, a, on almost weekly basis from the Texans. Um, uh, and we make a goodly amount of whiskey every year, but we, we're, we, we just can't go every place at once. And it's not our desire to go every place at once. We right. want to go to, to the right markets control and the markets, growth. Yeah. control growth, and, and especially the markets where we have some friends and where we can, can grow deep in those markets rather than broad to lots of markets. But we are in California. Uh, you can pick up a new riff at, uh, there's a store in Los Angeles and two in the San Francisco area, K&L Wines. Uh, speaking as a former liquor retailer uh, at the Party Source, K&L Wines is a great, great store. It's so great to go in there and visit with them and, and see a, a great store like that. Uh, K&L Wines uh, ships to, I think, a few states but they certainly ship inside the state of California and you can find all new Rift products from k and Wines. Uh, I, I can tell you uh, California on a wider basis is probably on our shorter list of places to get to uh, than say, I would say North Dakota, except we're already in North Dakota. <laughs> we, have, <laughs> we have a friend retailer up there from our retailing days that sells in, uh, in a few stores in North Dakota of all places. God bless them in North Dakota. But we'll get to California uh, somewhat sooner than later, uh, maybe next year, but you can get it now shipped to you in California from uh, K&L Wines, klwines.com. Great right. store. Uh, someone asked me, will this be archived? I missed the beginning. Yes. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll shoot you a, a link where you can see this again. I, I record all these just to be sure in case someone misses it. So don't want you to miss out. The, the most important thing besides drinking the whiskey is hearing from the folks that, uh, that make it. So we'll have that. Uh, do you know when uh, we, you know, we tra uh, tasted nine awesome whiskeys? When will you know if we can get those in Texas? Uh, you know, you, you now you know who, who the, the players are, who the people at the distillers are. You participate in these events. You got to reach out to them. I mean, they're going to be the ones that will be able to tell you when and where it'll be in Texas if it is already. So uh, I would touch base with, with them. And if you're having any problem locating uh, anybody, let me know and I, I'd be more than happy to help you out on that. Uh, Jay, just another quick question for you, uh, diameter of your column. So we're getting into the nerdly stuff now. I think you share that on your tour. So if it's uh, okay to share that, if it's proprietary, you don't have to, but uh, I, I think I've heard that before. I just don't remember the diameter sure. of your column still. Sure, no, I just actually replied to Adam's question. Oh, okay. Uh, not proprietary at all. There's there's a few things at New Rift that are proprietary. We love sharing things like the mash bill on the back of the bottle. Um, it's a 24 inch diameter uh, beer still. Okay. Uh, and that's, uh, that's feeding a 375 gallon uh, copper doubler. The entire distillation path is copper. Anywhere that the beer is hot or the, the alcohol is in a vaporous state, we want it in contact with copper. And so all of the line arms, the, the uh, condensers, 
it, it's not just a matter of put some copper in the distillation path. The entire distillation path is copper, uh, as I suspect many of our friend distillers here tonight uh, have also spec their distilleries out. Um, we didn't want to take any chance on what would be enough copper contact with the whiskey, uh, both for reasons of, of cleaning up the distillate and, and sweetening it and, and getting rid of, the, of the, the off flavors that come that hang around after the first distillation, but particularly also to the point of aging. Uh, copper is very important for any spirit that is going to be aged. And so uh, it might not matter if you're making you know, grappa or, or silver tequila or things like that, gin and vodka and so on could be made in stainless steel, but bourbon, all the, all the aged brown spirits, brandies and so on really want some copper in the distillation path. And we just went whole hog and it's, it's all copper. That's awesome. That's a commitment to quality. Whenever you're talking is still that big. That's a, that's a lot of copper. So bravo. Thank you. Adam, question for you. Just a, a couple more questions. So we've got one for you, one for Lenny, and we'll wrap it up on that note. But uh, first to you, uh, asking specifically about our Bananas Foster pick. How do you get so much flavor in a very young whiskey, 15 months old? How do you pack that much flavor into that thing? So that was uh, really two different things. Uh, cat, get out of here. Uh, that was a combination of that particular mash bill, uh, crazy mash bills, only 51% corn, but it was 51% white corn. Um, and then we went 40% rye on it. And then 9% uh, of that uh, mash bill was that Pilsner malt. Um, but then the still was, was the big thing. We, we noticed that banana character was just unbelievably evident in um, the aroma, right? When you walked in the distillery while that thing was fermenting and we're like, we've got to be able to preserve this through distillation. Uh, so what we did is we were able to utilize um, that column still. So unlike a traditional column still, we've got our stripping column. It's fed over to a doubler. Then on top of the doubler, there's a heat exchanger and then a four plate column and then another heat exchanger on the top of that. So we can basically make, make multiple cuts um, off of that column. So uh, what we did is we opened up the plates and we ran the bottom heat exchanger at a point, uh, we, we modified it relative to, to previous distillations uh, to allow a little more of that banana character through. But the cool thing about that, um, that particular column that we're running is that if you can imagine, we've got a heat exchanger here, a heat exchanger here, plates in between, and we can choose um, if we want one, two, three, or four plates, or any combination of those to pull off as our hearts. Um, and I'll say we ran that still very atypical of how we normally would, uh, just to make sure that we could carry through as much of that character. Um, and that's uh, one of the cool things about that coffee still is you can kind of control your cut points. So what we did is we kind of loosened up the cut points to allow a little more of that fruit and a little more of that mouthfeel um, on that particular product. Excellent. Uh, Lenny, and then uh, I will let the legend, he says he's got a question for Jay. We'll let uh, him come in live and, and ask that. Uh, so, so two more questions. Lenny, the, the last one for you is, uh, is there any consideration for doing like a, a defining a Colorado whiskey? So, you know, something that uh, we've done in Missouri and uh, uh, I've seen them do it in New York too with their rye. Uh, is there any, any idea that uh, they may be something coming along the lines of a Colorado whiskey? Uh, you're on mute, buddy. Oh, there we go. My bad. Uh, so, you know, uh, discussions of that have gone down amongst the other distillers. We, the Colorado Distillers Guild is actually the largest distillers guild in the country, which is kind of weird. But we do also have the most distillers per capita in uh, our state. <laughs> uh, so I hear. Um, every time we have a meeting, I scream about it literally like I yell I'm like guys what what are you doing like of all the things like let's do it because um, you know there, there are appellations for a lot of things in a lot of regions but my thought is set it at the very least one of the things that defines the state is the elevation so maybe set it at a minimum a minimum elevation of one mile high and there's some parts of Colorado that are lower but most are higher so let's say like at that point, it, it cannot be a Colorado whiskey. So I guess to the point of the question, uh, I've got a lot of opinions on it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm going to keep screaming about it. I, I hope it happens someday because I think there's a lot of rad things happening in this state. There's a lot of scrappy 
attitudes and, and, and cool things happening from really neat distilleries. So hopefully yeah. that's coming down the pike, but right now there's not a lot of push there. Uh, but yeah, hopefully that changes. Yeah. You guys are kind of getting it together too. I mean, you got your, your trail together with, you know, about yep. a year ago or so. And uh, yeah. So as, as you, as you look down the road, that could be something that's on the docket. It sounds like. So. Yes. Yes. Cool. cool. We'll see. All right. Last one, the legend, Rick Brenner himself. Let's bring in, open up your mic. And you had, said you had a question for Jay. What is it, my friend? Jay, you, uh, you touched on the uh, Balbo Rye. Yes, sir. And <clears throat> which I thought was fantastic. Thank you. Um, well, I was I was thinking since this was kind of a you know experiment that it might take another four years to see some more of it if it worked out right. Have you been putting down more since the first batch, where it might not be four years? Great, great question. There are there are some things we do like the recently uh, released Backsetter project that truly will take uh, four years to do uh, another, uh, a fresh batch, if you will. Yeah. Uh, there are our specialty whiskeys, for want of a better term, that we make at New Riff, that uh, we do one time, we've never repeated them, or we repeat them rarely. And then there are some that um, we, we repeat all the time. In the case of our whiskeys that are driven by, by grain uh, harvests, really, or, or uh, of course, we make 100% malted rye every month. Uh, we, we, we are, we might be the biggest recipient of, uh, I think we're the number one distilling customer of our malted rye supplier. I could be wrong about that, but we, we make a lot of malted rye, but, but that goes on all the time. We have other things that, that are harvests for us that our farmer in, and he's actually located in, in Indiana, Greensburg, Indiana, um, grows for us where we have said, here, take these seeds right here, grow this. And uh, he has grown for us heirloom corn, a couple of different heirloom corns. Heirloom wheat will be coming out someday uh, with a weeded bourbon made from these heirloom uh, grains. Uh, I know that is near and dear to the heart of Alan Bishop as well. So uh, we are thinking all along the same lines there. Uh, in the case of Balboa, he grows Balboa every year. And so every year since the first one, we have distilled uh, some Balboa. Uh, it took the form early on of very, uh, of, of, of a fleeting, you know, we do one here, we do one there. He's got, you know, 12,000 pounds to distill. In recent years, I think since maybe 2017, we have been distilling a, a whole silo, a trailer full, a 50,000 pound load of, of rye at a go. And so, uh, uh, yes, we absolutely have more Balboa coming uh, someday, but also greater amounts of it in a given year. So, um, uh, it'll still be still be limited and hard to find, but it won't be quite as hard to find as it was the first time. And there will be more. Well, I, I got mine because I'm a member of your whiskey club. So thank you, excellent. Yeah, I, I actually made a drive from St. Louis, con my daughter into signing up for the club so I could get four bottles of it. So. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah. I don't know Love if that's it. legal. You might get kicked out of the Love club. It. No, no. <laughs> Love it. You're not kicked out of the club at all. In fact, <laughs> it, 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 it is the wine that made her a a, a rye drinker. You Fantastic. did not get four bottles as, of that. As a distiller, I'm going to step in momentarily, and I'm going to say that Rick Brenner and Jen Brenner are exactly the kind of fans that you want for your distillery 100%, because those Aww. two go out of their way to come get come get cool stuff and just hang out. So, can't well, do we any better. Well, we love you, Alan. So. Thank I you, know, Alan. I'm awesome. Plus, I got a, a Fibonacci sequence going from you, so that's awesome. Now I got to go to New Riff and hold it up in front of the still. <laughs> No, but uh, no, I was I was glad that you mentioned that, Jay, because I, I was thinking I told people well, if this was an experiment, it turned out good. It took four years. It might be another four years before we ever see any more of this. No, no, no. We distilled uh, Balboa with every harvest from uh, from our farmer, and more of it as the years went by. When the uh, I'm not a <clears throat> I don't like heavily peated scotches, right? But I thought the backsetter turned. Both, both versions of the backs that are turned out great. Thank you for the comment. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I adore Petey Scotch and, and I, I loved how it happened out in, in Backsetter, but certainly I would say the, the bulk of the bourbon community, uh, I mean, many of them are bourbon drinkers because they're not Scotch drinkers. They don't like Scotch. And uh, some of them have said, I think the, the, the general response has been, we love you guys innovating. Keep up the good work. Yeah. Thank you. And, I'm necessarily I, 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 thrilled to to a smoky. Uh, 
PD Bourbon. It's just where you got to stay. You don't look at Reddit. Don't ever look at Reddit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, it, it, the point is not was not there to make peated bourbon. In fact, it's not a peated bourbon because it doesn't have any peated malted barley put into the mash. The only yeah. grains in the mash are corn and rye and barley. It just is peated, is, is backset with, with peated stuff. And so sure enough, it, it did come out peaty. And we, that is one that was, um, I, I don't want to say it was unintentional. It was not, it was, it was intentional. We did not make a mistake. But with backsetter, uh, where we, one day, the only backset that we had was from a peated malted barley distillation. And we decided what the, <clears throat> what the hay put it in the, 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 the mash and, uh, and it became backsetter. Uh, we didn't go into it thinking, well, we'll make a new product out of this. This has never been done before. This, this will make a really cool whiskey. We just went on with the day's work and made the whiskey and, and semi forgot about it for the next four years. So um, that is one that to get any quantity of it will take uh, some years to recover. And the, the, the problem being we have to commit to a, about 13 or 14 barrels of peated malted barley whiskey in order to make any backsetter. Now, I love me some peated malted barley whiskey, but <laughs> there's only so much we can make and sell. So um, we, we will make some more of that uh, actually here next month, uh, some, some of those things. So it'll be a while before they come back out, but it was fun. All right. Well, I want to thank, uh, you know, our, our distillers. So we've got, uh, of course, Alan Bishop, we got Lenny Eckstein, we've got Adam Stumpf, and of course, Jay Ayersman for really, you know, being part of this, taking time out of their schedule, providing the whiskey that we got to drink, telling us about it, telling us the backstory, what the future holds. Really appreciate it, all you guys. Really couldn't have been a better event. And I thank you so much for being part of this. And it was some great whiskey that we enjoyed tonight. And I just love this because... Uh, you know, it, it just goes to show you how great craft whiskey is out there. And, and, and there are some really good things happening out there. So please, you know, expand your horizons and enjoy some of that. Uh, and, and really a great team out there. Of course, I also want to thank my, my friend and uh, colleague, Justine Mays, who you know, does all the logistics and makes all the stuff possible. So there's a lot of coordination that she has to do and, and getting you guys that stuff out safely. Uh, is, is no small task, and uh, she's not happy when she's, she's doing it, but she's happy and satisfied participating in something like this and seeing it all come together. So uh, really, really great stuff and really great night and, and great first, first month. So we did uh, two of these events, tried nine different whiskeys, and uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it and, and felt like uh, it was worth your time. So appreciate it. With that, we're going to uh, wrap this one up. And again, thanks for everybody for being part of it. And, uh, and for our distillers, thank you as well. Take care, everybody.